Welcome to Not Your Average Tabletop. I'm Zach, and for today's rules recipe, we're going to be looking at Red Rising. Not Your Average Tabletop. Woohoo! The ingredients that make up the Red Rising Collector's Edition are six house tiles with the metal influence tokens and metal fleet tokens of those specific colors, the sovereign token, the first player token which is a crescent moon, the custom rising die, 60 helium tokens along with a game board, and 112 character cards of 14 different colors. And In the collector's edition there are also card trays to hold your cards for each color. Then you have a score pad, six reference cards, and also an Automa solo deck. To set up Red Rising, place the board on the table. Shuffle the deck of character cards and place it face down on the board. Place the rising die next to the deck. On each location, Jupiter, Mars, Luna, and the Institute, place two character cards from the deck face up. These cards overlap, so only the victory points, name, and color of the covered cards are exposed. Note that players may look at any of the colors on any locations at any time. Next, you will draw five character cards from the deck to form your starting hand. Your hand of cards is kept private throughout the game. After that, you will gain a random house tile. Start with your house's ten influence tokens in your personal supply. You'll try to place them on the Institute during the game. Place your house's fleet token on the zero space on the fleet track. Place all helium tokens in the designated spot below the deck to create the supply. Place the sovereign token nearby. This represents the leader of the society. For a two-player game, you'll want to also place three additional influence tokens of an unused house color into the institute. This represents a neutral house, making endgame scoring more competitive. Now you'll look, and if a player has the house Apollo, Give them the first player token, otherwise randomly select a player and give them the first player token. They can proceed to take their first turn. The first player token will remain in that player's possession throughout the game. After you have this set up, then you get onto the gameplay, where on every one of your turns you will either use the lead or scout action, and resolving any effects or bonuses. When leading, you will select a card from your hand and deploy it face up on any location covering all but the name, color, and core value of the topmost card at that location. If possible, trigger the deployability of the card played, unless it gives you an option not to. Then to complete a lead action, you will either gain a top card of a location that you did not deploy to this turn, then gain that location's bonus. Or you can gain the top card of the deck, then roll the rising die, and gain the resulting bonus. If you instead choose to use the scout action, you will reveal the top card of the deck and place, not deploy, it on any location covering all but the name, color, and core value of the topmost card at that location. Gain that location's bonus. Players typically only choose to scout if they're completely satisfied with their hand. For Jupiter, you will advance on the fleet track. If you have reached the end of the fleet track, you may not advance further. For Mars, you will gain one helium token. There is no limit to helium tokens. If the supply is empty, use a suitable replacement. For Luna, you will gain or keep the Sovereign token. This triggers the bonus on your house tile. For the Institute, you will place one of your influence tokens on this location. If you have already placed all ten of your tokens, you cannot place more. Lastly, the deck is not a location, but if you choose to draw a card from the deck instead of one of the four locations during the lead action, you roll the rising die, which grants you a mandatory bonus. The bonuses follow the same restrictions and allowances as noted above. In addition to these actions, there are also two other faces on the die, which allow you to banish the top card of a location of your choice, or reveal the top card of the deck and place, not deploy it, on any location. As noted above, when gaining the Sovereign token, it will interact with your house tile. Each house tile has an ability that is triggered whenever you gain the Sovereign token, even if you already have it. Typically, this will happen by gaining a card from Luna, but it also applies to any card ability from which you gain the token, as well as rolling Luna on a rising die. 
First gain the Sovereign token, then trigger the ability. The house's abilities are mandatory, not optional. A couple cases that are highly unlikely but may happen are the deck runs out. If this is the case and there are no cards in the deck, the deck simply ceases to be an option for players to draw from or interacted with. Also, there is a chance that a player may have zero cards in their hand. If you have no cards in your hand, you can still either lead or scout on your turn. If you lead, skip the deploy portion of the lead action, as you have no cards in hand to deploy. One of the most important things to know in Red Rising is the anatomy of the character cards. First off, you've got the name and color of the card in the top right of the card, along with the core value number of endgame points in the top left. You also have a deploy ability uh, where it will tell you what this card can do when it is deployed. And lastly, on the very bottom of the card, you will have some endgame bonuses and points. And if a card refers to colors or specific characters, if with a red, if with a blue, uh, for each gold, it's referring to other cards in your hand. Additionally, some cards may have a block ability. This is an optional ability that requires you to reveal a card to prevent an opponent's attempt to do something to you. Also, on the left portion of the side of the card, there will be an indicator of what this card wants to or does not want to interact with for endgame bonuses. There are three different conditions that can be met to help the game end be triggered. These are a player having seven or more helium tokens, a player having seven or more influence on the Institute, and a player reaching or surpassing seven on the fleet track. The way the game end would be triggered is if all three of these conditions are met by a combination of players or when any two of these conditions are met by the same player. You will then finish taking turns until each player has taken the same number of turns in the game. If Apollo is an active house, they take the last turn. This is an extra turn. Use the score pad to tally each player's score step by step in this order. First, any at end of game abilities on cards. Starting with the first player, trigger all of your end of game abilities in an order of your choosing. Continue clockwise with the next player until all players have triggered these abilities. Only orange and gray cards have at end game abilities. Cards of the same color have the same at end of game ability. Then you will go to your character cards and add up any core value and end game bonus points. Then you will score points based on your position on the fleet track from 0 to 43 points. After that you will gain 3 points per helium token you have. Then whoever has the sovereign token will gain an additional 10 points. Lastly you'll go to the influence at the institute and see the players who have the most influence and gain 4 points for each of the influence they have there. The player with the second most influence from the institute will gain 2 per influence they have there. All other players will gain one point per influence. Note again that in a two-player game, three non-player influence tokens will start on the Institute. The two players will include those three tokens in the end game comparison as if they were a third house. Lastly, you will look and see if you have any excess cards. For each card in your hand beyond the seventh card, lose 10 points. At this time, you've already accounted for other points from these cards. Those points are still valid. This penalty represents the unwieldiness of managing a larger house and encourages players to focus on cards that work well together, not simply more cards. The player with the highest score wins the game. A great final score is 300 or more points. If there is a tie for first place, the tied players with the sovereign token wins. If no tied player has the sovereign token, share the victory. I hope that gives you a good idea of how to play Red Rising. If you have any other questions about the game, please leave a comment below and I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, don't let your boxes rise too much. And keep on nibbling.